Thank you. I'm very excited about today's program uh, for any number of reasons. But before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to welcome a special guest who's sitting here in the front row, Murray Larry. Uh, Murray's uh, fingerprints are all over Alachua County. Uh, Fifty years ago, she prepared the nomination form for the campus national uh, register uh, historic district, which had everything to do with uh, saving us after the horrors of GPA. Uh, <clears throat> she uh, did the national historic landmark nomination for the Dudley Farm, uh, house and farm, and successfully presented it in Washington. I happened to be there that day, and it was a great presentation. Uh, <clears throat> she has done the uh, uh, nominations for almost every small town in the county, as well as many, many buildings. So thank you for being here, Laurie uh, Murray. She also did the nomination for my little uh, Presbyterian church in Archer, for which we are very thankful. Um, <clears throat> uh, you can't sit. Stand up, Murray. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Our speaker today, um, Jay Reeves, I've known since he was a child. Uh, <laughs> And that's not much of an exaggeration. I have a much younger sister, 25 years younger than I, who was in architecture school with Jay. Uh, she and he were in a group of four in a studio there. And she continually came home raving about Jay Reeves and how good he was. So um, uh, again, uh, uh, I've always had a high opinion of him. but. Um, <clears throat> he um, was in school when the first uh, historic preservation ordinance in Gainesville was adopted. And since that time, he has served on the uh, Gainesville Historic Preservation Board for at least 25 years, and on and off has served as chairman of that board. He serves as chairman now. And <clears throat> we, are, uh, we are deeply indebted to Jay for his work, if you're at all interested in preserving some vestiges of historic Gainesville. Uh, <clears throat> Gainesville is, uh, Jay is a, a practicing architect and has done uh, a great deal of important research to make sure that uh, historic buildings in Gainesville are restored properly. And so I asked him to talk this morning about some of his favorite projects um, in part because uh, those of you who are from Gainesville will recognize these buildings and will be particularly interested in how their restoration occurred. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jay. All right, thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here today and to share a little glimpse of uh, the type of work I've been had the pleasure of working on over the last 30 years and continue to work on. Um, I love Gainesville. I find myself very lucky to com come back to Gainesville. I came back in 1990 after graduating in 86, and um, I was called back by my professors who had a very important and significant project, and they actually needed an architect to actually execute the drawings, and it turned out it was my first project and that would be the Matheson Center. So I kind of came back into the fold, and uh, lo and behold, I've been here ever since. And uh, it's been an honor. Um, to tell you a little bit about <clears throat> OK, That's, this is just a snapshot of Gainesville from a bird's eye view done in 1884. But this is looking towards the northeast. This would be what we call today the Duck Pond area. You're seeing the old wooden courthouse in the middle of the square. So the new brick courthouse had not been yet completed. You're seeing Main Street, which is now um, second. You're seeing the railroad tracks going down West Main Street. And you'll see a lot of the old brick commercial buildings and mainly all wooden buildings. Um, you could count the number of brick buildings on your hand, and uh, 
this has been uh, a real strong guide for me in uh, finding historic projects, uh, restoring historic buildings, locating them. Um, and it's been a major tool, especially lately, because I've been on a personal mission to locate the oldest surviving buildings we have. And I'm on number five or six of the original 1850s buildings right now that I've located and uh, working on various ones restoring right now. Um, most people didn't realize any of the oldest structures were even left. They really didn't know much about them because um, the city was basically founded in 1854. But um, the first buildings were all around the perimeter of it. And uh, that's the history I've, I've been diving into. And that's basically by using some of the oldest guides, which are the Sanchez papers that the University of Florida has in the PKO library. And they're all hidden, handwritten documents that talk about um, Gainesville, the earliest days, the earliest people, what happened when, they were written around the turn of the century. Thank you. And uh, they've been a fantastic resource. So I use those, the old Sanborn fire insurance maps, and I use bird's eye views, old photographs when I can find them, which are a lot more rare to come across. But anyway, what this is what I'm showing you today is kind of a snapshot of this oldest area of Gainesville, which is so rich in history. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the common sites and the projects within this area that I've had the pleasure to work on over the years. And the first one, well, this is a, just a shot of our historic board. We have a great historic board, great historic preservation director recently came here from Miami. And um, we have a, a good, good group of people that are very involved in the community. We're getting more and more involved with the University of Florida and uh, helping out with the students and when we can. And so good things are happening. I'm gonna start with this uh, because this is one of my most important projects to me personally. This is in 1990 um, when in the duck pond, there was a house slated for demolition uh, right behind the first Methodist church on second Avenue. This was a shot of it when it had the sign on it, which I believe the sign was up for about 15 to 20 years. They were trying to give it away. Nobody would take it. All the best uh, builders, architects, and everybody else had said, can't be done, can't be moved, too big to go down the streets. And lo and behold, this young architect, as Roy referred to, came along. I just barely got my license. Um, at a Matheson Center meeting, I heard that this house was going to be burnt to the ground. And uh, so I jumped right on top of it. And I went down, talked to the church, told them I was a young preservation architect and I would love to take this on as a project. And the only way this was possible was with the help of Roy Hunt, who ironically had divided some property in the duck pond and had a lot he wasn't going to use. And therefore, I approached him about it. He agreed to sell it to me. And that was the other key piece of information, right directly across from the park from where it sat, which allowed it to go through the middle of the park. Talk about timing. So basically, this was my biggest and first historic preservation project personally. And this is it, moving through the middle of Roper Park in 1992 on a rainy, wet day where most of the people from the city were playing hooky watching it. It took about eight hours to make it from one end of the park to the other, and this was a dream come true to me. And it was just one of the most exciting things I've ever done. Also one of the most nerve wracking things I've ever done. This shows you the house up in the air. This shows you as it was being finished up. The other great thing about this project is my father had just retired from the FAA. So mom and dad came down every single weekend for several years, my brother too, friends from, Gain from uh, Jacksonville, and it was a big group effort because I was a young, starving architect that had just opened my firm and uh, took this massive project on, but it was turned out to be one of the most important things I've ever done because it is still my home to this day. It's been my office many times, and now that I'm downsized, it's my office again, and it is one block from the building department, right in the middle of one of the most significant historic districts around. 
and I can walk to everything. So it's been a dream come true and it's still a dream come true. And the projects I'm gonna show you are all within walking distance of my house. This just shows you what the insides turned out. It was a very significant house built by Senator William Hill in 1912. However, um, the church had owned it for years and years and years. It had some of the most significant termite damage I've ever seen in my life. And basically it was about ready for demolition. It took somebody who had a hard head and uh, a little naive. <laughs> as it sits today and I'm con continually remodeling again, you know, as the longer you live in a house, the more you have to do to it. But that's, it's, it's, a, it's a labor of love. But anyway, I showed it to you because this is the home base. Right behind this house is a house that has lingered for years and years and years. It, it was bought by a hoarder and basically pretty much destroyed it. It was in pretty bad condition to begin with when they got in in 1990. And then it's been abandoned for the last 20 something years. The neighborhood um, basically and the historic board and everybody else just said, okay, let it, let the trees grow up, let it just go. Eventually we'll win out. And this was the house, the picture of it taken two years ago, the Hampton house or the Blake Hampton house built in 1858. Indeed, one of the oldest, but not the oldest in the neighborhood. And the house was in horrendous condition. The city manager and code enforcement came in with their bulldozers, ready to tear it down. Didn't even go to the historic board. We said, excuse me, wait a minute. We stopped them. We had a meeting with the city manager, brought it to his attention that this was a very significant structure, what needed to happen. The owner needed to sell it, get out of, get to him out of the house, basically relieve the million dollars in fines, which were never gonna be collected and find a new buyer for the house. And we did this over code enforcement's objections, but it was a historic preservation project that had to happen. We'd all patiently waited it for it to happen. And we were lucky. It went on the market. We got a young builder to take it on, and it has been under underway for quite a while. This is as it looks now. It's about 70 to 80% done. They're working on the interiors, and it's been kind of taken back to the less Victorian earlier days of what it, what it was built in the 1850s. The house still has all the original board walls on the inside, beaded uh, eight inch wide plank board wall ceilings, wide random plank floors it it is rustic and the whole back wing of the house had to come down because it was a series of bad additions so basically we let them take that down but reconstruct the whole rear wing and it's all post and beam framed inside like the original section and it's very rustic massive cooking style fireplace brick floors it's modeled very much after the old 1850s farmhouses and that's what we've ended up with something we never thought would happen, never thought we'd live long enough, and yet it is happening. And it is something, it's, a, it's been a win. And uh, we use it as a training exercise to show the architecture students what can happen. It's, it's still underway, but it's getting close. So I show you, this is right in my backyard, 1858 house, one of the first in the neighborhood. And it survived all these years. Yes, you did. <laughs> and this is a, is a church that is located directly across the park from me. This is the Kavanaugh Methodist Church built in uh, 1886. Um, it was the second building. The first building was a much smaller wooden structure and it was moved into the neighborhood and made into a house. This is what the building did not look like as long as anybody could remember. It had, uh, they built a new sanctuary next door to it in 1941. The architects decided to basically neuter it. They took the tower off, they took all the stained glass off, they removed everything that made it look like a sanctuary. And it, as you're gonna see, this was probably one of the most significant restoration projects I've done. I did the research, found out what the interiors originally looked like. 
there were members of the church that didn't even know it ever had a tower. And this is just to show there was one elderly lady I found that remembered it. And that was it. And I convinced them with the photographs. They approached me about renovating it. It was their fellowship hall, had been since the 40s, but it was in really bad shape. And I said, here's our opportunity to take it back and to put it all back and to recapture that character of that building, even though it'll still be Fellowship Hall, it'll be have the, the significance back that the building completely lost. It wasn't even listed on the local register as being significant. And that just goes to show you, I found this one photograph that showed the interior organ part of it, so I had clues to go on. The rest of it was discovered during uh, selective demolition. This is a picture of it from the street on, on 2nd Street. You can see the stained glass windows clearly. You can see the brickwork, which is very unique. It's a very unique structure. This is what it looked like when we started. Not much character to it. This is what it looked like inside. It was basically a school lunchroom cafeteria and nothing in it really signified that that was a historic structure. So basically the church went with my ideas. They loved it. It was a big project to take on. We knew we were gonna have some budget tackles and we did. So we did a little fundraising in the end. This goes to show you taking it apart, finding the missing clues. We found the pulpit area buried back behind additions and walls. We found woodwork that was still in place below drop ceilings. We found all kinds of clues. We did additions to the back of the building, so we, they had a new kitchen. Plus, we knew we wanted to put the tower back. That involved hand sourcing the brick, hand mixing the brick, getting everything back to the original colorations, getting into details. This was the addition we put at the back of the building, ironically, where my house sat. So <laughs> the stories are all kind of interconnected. It's kind of fun the way that works. But this just goes to show you, we even, we even mimicked, we even mimicked the uh, brickwork that you see on the building and the, the iconic features, the granite window sills. We made everything match as authentically as we could. The old church bell had been moved to the attic when they took the tower down in 1941. They never rang it because nobody could hear it. And it sat there all these years where nobody even knew it was there. So that was the other thing. We had the old church bell to work with. We started to put the tower back up. We built uh, the roof on the ground. We built a steel frame inside, and then we raised it up, put the bell back up on the top where you can see there. This shows you what it looks like today with the original tower put back based on the photographic evidence and all the evidence we had to go with. The bell rings every Sunday, and I must tell you, it feels a little bit like being in Europe hearing that church bell go. This just shows you the front of the building. The other part of the building that was very significant to restore from the outside was this wonderful stained glass it had. We had great photos of it. The stained glass was taken out. It was put in the basement of one of the neighboring buildings that flooded. All the dirt from the crawl space came in there. The windows folded, they were walked on, they were crushed, they were taken apart and sold at garage sales. And what was left were Tupperware containers filled up with the pieces which the little old ladies took out of the lead and sorted them according to color and size, which was my total nightmare. Because I not only had to work from the black and white photographs to reproduce these things, I had to match the missing pieces to the color and we managed to find the centerpieces of all the hand-painted centerpieces of the windows that we needed the church members had bought at the garage sale and we got those back. So we were able to restore these windows. These windows are incredible that we were able to do this. And McIntyre stained glass, working with me, were able to put it all back together. This is like the photographs we had to work from. So we, we had the designs, we had pieces to go with, but no exact colors. These are the sections that were saved. So we had these to restore back into the windows. 
This is what I had to do. I had to piece the windows back together, and this is just using Prismacolor to come up with the color schemes up to the best we could. And this is the windows going back together. And that's the other thing that makes this space really spectacular, is we got this 1880s aesthetic style stained glass restored back just the way it was, that was lost forever. This shows you the interior of the hall, shows you the windows in place, and now with the raised ceiling, the woodwork, the original heart pine floors, just the way it was, it is a beautiful building now, and uh, both inside and out, and a very significant historic structure. It did win a Florida Trust Award in 2014, and um, this one was one of my biggest pleasures to bring this building back and to work with the church. But to tell you, we were running out of money on the project. The, the stained glass windows almost didn't happen. The church members donated, would buy a window to, to commemorate their family the way they were done originally. And that's how we got the stained glass done. The tower, we had no money for. And that was heartbreaking to me. So me and one of the church members schemed and uh, we got some help from a local contributor whose family, I don't think he would mind match, mentioning Davis Rembert, his family was significant in that church. And um, he donated the money for the tower and the tower happened. And um, it made the project, it would not have been the same project without that, but it happened and it was significant and important. I, being the architect I am, being an amateur archaeologist and our amateur historian, can't let stuff go. I had to figure out who was the church architect because we had this building, we had the East Florida Seminary building, the brick jail, and the brick courthouse. That were all the brick buildings in Gainesville at the time. Figured it could not be that hard to track down who the designers were. Boy, was I wrong. I researched and researched. The building has very distinctive features. It's a Gothic building, but with a tower that is of a French mansard style. You had the East Florida Seminary building next door, which was the same exact thing. Both buildings had burnt brick detailing on them, which is a really interesting trademark you don't see very often. We had a church tower that had five spires, which is a French church tower top. But trying to figure all that out, I searched and searched and searched. What I eventually discovered was the Methodist Church was a stock design from the Methodist Conference up in Cleveland. That on that, the, the hand-drawn drawing there is a version of it in wood. It is the same building. The interior shots proved it to be the same building. The one on the right hand side is in Maryland. It is the same building also, although the details are different. But same floor plan, it's everything, and it was built the same year as this one, 86. So that, that solved that. It did away with my theory about the two buildings being built at the same time. But I also researched the East Florida Cemetery building, which is next door. That was uh, facing this church building. They were built about the same time, this one a couple of years earlier. And um, this, this building was built as a seminary building. It was one of uh, the Florida's schools that uh, was basically a military type school. There were a number of them around Florida at that time. Originally, it started as the Gainesville Academy back before the Civil War. And this building still exists. It is part of the First United Methodist Church complex. However, it's hard to appreciate because they built their sanctuary across the front end of it. The tower was once again taken down. The details were kind of cleaned up and minimized. And so the building is pretty much engaged in the site right now. And um, the reason I'm showing you this building, it is one we have not done yet. It is supposed to be one of the future projects. I hope to put the tower back. I hope to disconnect it from the uh, fellowship, I mean, from the, their uh, current sanctuary. There was originally just a one-story walkway. They later made it into a two-story. That needs to come down. And we've talked about it. In the, in the future, we may do this. 
This shows you the two buildings, the pictures taken at the same time. Um, you can see this was pretty impressive architecture for the time in Gainesville when we had a bunch of small buildings, interesting old wooden houses. We had two stories and some really ornate ones, but not many because Gainesville was just being built from the ground up. And basically the East Florida Seminary building is in that shot right there. This shows you a couple of other shots of it and how it sits now. The interesting shots down at the bottom, which shows you the military cadets. They were out there with their cannons, marching gear. And the unique thing about this is this was um, a, a co-ed school to begin with. You had the, the, the men which were in military gear and you had the women which were just in long skirt. So it was a co-ed school. The interesting thing that I'm coming to, uh, this was the barracks building that sat across Roper Park right adjacent to where my house is. And that was the dormitories for the students and the faculty. Built in 1886, later chopped up and moved around the, to Second Street and it became part of the White House Hotel. And so everything tended to get recycled back then. But the one of the reasons I'm showing you the East Florida Seminary building and the park is because this went together with the Florida Agricultural College around 1905, but the Buckman Act, I believe, and um, basically this became the University of Florida. It was the beginning of the University of Florida. And while they were building the campus and uh, the, the original buildings there, the class was, classes happened here at uh, the East Florida Seminary building up until about I would guess by 1909 or something, they had, pretty, they had pretty much stopped at that point, and then it was sold to the First Methodist Church in uh, 1911. And they renovated, and it's been within their church complex ever since. This brings me to another one to show you. This is a picture of uh, Sam Gowan, who was a local historian, big member of uh, Historic Gainesville Incorporated, and pretty much responsible with others for saving the Thomas Center. He gave me this picture many, many years ago in a group of other photographs, and I was mystified by it. I had never seen this house. I didn't know where it was, and I just let it gnaw on me for a long time. And it had been labeled the DaCosta House in some of their early calendars, which it wasn't. DaCosta House was on a different house that I got to restore also and put the porches back. Turns out, um, I decided to go looking for it and the other 1850s houses I knew were there. And I did this methodically, um, searching histories, searching the bird's eye views, and trying to track different houses that didn't seem to have any information on them or location. Another one was the Anderson House, which is facing the Thomas Center Gardens, a big brown two-story right out the backyard of the Thomas Center. That one we restored, turned out it was 1854, a 300-acre tract where the original lumber mill in Gainesville was located on Sweetwater Branch right up until 1860. That house started being built out of cut logs. When the, when the lumber mill went online, that's when we have the saw marks and where it, it was finished up. And it's kind of an anonymous two-story house today but that was one of the first ones in Gainesville and it survived all these years, history was lost. And so finding that history, finding out all the history about the lumber mill and the people that ran the mill and, and the people that they basically, this was a crew from the Carolinas that built Gainesville. They were speculators. They came to Gainesville, they heard the railroad was coming. They started the lumber mill. They had all this virgin timber, they were, just outside the city limits, which were Fifth Avenue. And they set up shop. And basically, they built the original wooden courthouse, the original schools, all the original buildings, pretty much. The mill owner was an engineer. I attribute him to designing all these buildings because I didn't think there was anybody else that could have done it at the time. There were no architects. This, they were basically making it up as they go. Well, the mill, the, the supervisor that I'm talking about that came down, he came down with his brother who helped run the mill, other people that were family members as well. This is the house he built. 
for himself and you know his he owned the property with his brother too. It was 15 acres um, in the middle of the duck pond, included the duck pond on both sides. So basically, the whole center section where the uh, duck pond exists, and they're all basically 1920s houses because that was chopped up and developed in the 20s. But anyway, this house set at the end of Fifth Avenue, just over the creek, ironically right down the street from Sam Gowan and me, didn't even know it was there. It was moved in 26, however, to the corner of 6th and 6th. And it is a still a very large, imposing house, but all the porches were gone, all the details were gone, it was made into a duplex, the chimneys were moved, just about everything you could change about it, they did in 1926. And I met the owner of that house, and um, she had wanted me to try to identify the age of it. Started off looking at the old rim locks, noticing it had all the early features, opened up the rim locks, no copyright dates, even though they were they were a, a well-known company for rim locks, no copyright, which was my first clue. I'm looking at something that's really old. There were other clues within the house and it, it boiled down to trim around all the door casings. There was a beaded edge and that same beaded edge occurs on every eight, other 1850s or 1860s house I've ever seen. Okay, so I'm seeing all these, these features all the time keeping in mind that this house could be it but nothing about it seemed to match. And time goes by a few years, the house went up for sale, some new owners bought it, and the family had told them I had done some work on it. They came to me and I showed them the picture and I said, I have a really strong intuition and suspicion. This is that house. And if, there, if it is, I'm going to figure it out. And they were fascinated by it. And uh, it boiled down to doing all the tech detective work you can imagine. It boiled down to tracking everything on the outside of the house to figure it out what had been changed. In that picture, the porches wrap around the whole front. Well, now they, re they don't any longer because that whole corner had been filled in when the porches were removed. And all that evidence I could find. I mean, basically, Herschel Shepard, who was my mentor, architect in school and would be so proud of me because I was d using every trick in the book he had trained me with when I was a student bird dogging it being you know paying attention to the details and looking for all the clues going in the attic going everywhere everything one by one started to confirm it took me a, a week of working on this thing right down to using this photograph doing perspectives to check all the dimensions of the porches to see how they had altered the roof line to see how everything came together and lo and behold everything matched now that was that was the exhilarating part and the the fun part but the, the really intriguing part and the part that kind of baffled me a bit is that this house was much older than i thought it was and I did the history, tracked it all the way back to 1859 is when it was built. And it was built by the mill group. And this is where they lived because I found that on the, uh, the, the, um, what am I trying to say? The census, 1860 census, that the census started off at the house I already mentioned facing the Thomas Center Gardens went to that house, then it went to the house right directly behind me. So all those houses were here in the 1850s. This house, I was a little baffled because I, I had run across Italian aid styling, which this most definitely was. However, it's usually on later Victorians, 1880s, 1890s, and I was a little baffled. So I had to bone up on, on Italian aid Turns out that is the romantic styling of early Victorian at the time when you had Gothic revival and you had all these high styles, which I was blown away that a high styled house would have been built in Gainesville in the 1850s because everything's always come later here. But that had to do with 
somebody from the Carolinas, knew Charleston, knew those areas, knew the styles of architecture. And so we had a high styled house for Gainesville back at that early date. The house I have suspicions about, um, it's very large, almost as many porches as interior space. It's a very tall house with 12 foot ceilings up and down. And the living spaces appear to have been on the second floor, which is kind of unusual. Big grand Italianate staircase. And I'm still figuring out a lot of the nuances of the floor plans. We know it had outbuildings. We know it had stables. And we know it was a very large structure. Um, but it, because it wasn't in the city of Gainesville, the history was just lost completely. And so this is the house I am currently working on now. We're just applying for permits. And to show you a little bit, this was the bird's eye view. What I found was the back side of the house. And this confirmed the chimney locations. It confirmed where porches were located, but I couldn't see the two-story verandas that went around the other side. Found that on the Sanborns later, but they were much later Sanborns when some of the porches had already been removed. So it didn't completely jive with it, but figured it all out. This was a list of the original um, residents of Gainesville, and it, it's really good that it gives what they did. This had the Finger Brothers, were the, which they're the group of guys I was talking about from the mill. Um, that uh, listed them on as being some of the first residents in Gainesville. And I, in fact, the Sanchez papers said they moved here in 1854 to build the town. Everything was confirmed. This is another Italian eight house, and this one is up in Jacksonville. And uh, it's just to show you the character and style. This is what you typically would have seen was a cupola and all that, but you have to remember Gainesville at that time was the outback. And what we got was pretty impressive for original Gainesville. But that just goes to show you, this is kind of the character of where we're going with it to take it all back. This is what the interiors were once again look like. They, they already have the uh, four over four window sashes, which are kind of interesting. That, that was not a cheap window for that time, but it is also a window you see in the 1850s. You see a lot of arched openings and, and such, and we are going to put one of those openings back. But the old four panel doors, they all match the old, other old houses from the 1850s exact. And so this has been a fun treasure hunt, but the other exciting part is the owners. They're fairly young, they're in their late 40s. They, the, 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 the lady grew up in uh, the Duck Pond area. They are fairly worldly. They have a house in Austria too. They are going to restore it all back and put it back the way it was. And this will be their forever home. And it should be a pretty magnificent one when it's done. So here is another project that was completely lost. And lo and behold, it's coming back. And this is this kind of the kind of projects that I am passionate about. I enjoy, they're a challenge, they're a puzzle and finding them is, Part of the part of the challenge and the excitement but this is the stuff i tend to enjoy and every one of them is an education and the other part of course is finding the contractors that can do it and the contractor we settled on is on the historic board with me he is uh recently completing rosewood in pleasant street that had burned last year and so he cut himself on that one and he's learning the tricks and the and so this will be his second italian egg and uh, pleasure to work with a board member too. But anyway, that gives you a snapshot into what's in the duck pond. So much history. This, to tell you where I'm going next is continuing to get the information, eventually assemble it into some written form that'll be here long after I will. And I'm also into the Sanchez papers talking about the Civil War and what happened right in the downtown area, including the Duck Pond area. And so the, sto the stories are fascinating. And this, this is all handwritten, mind you, very difficult to read. And you have to kind of piece all the different stories together, but that's what I'm doing. But it has been fascinating piecing 
the information and history behind the group of men that came to Gainesville, opened up shop, decided to build the town, moved, shut down everything and moved out in 1860 because the war was coming. So they went to Texas from there. And this was also uh, Tillman Ingram who uh, had built uh, the old uh, Roper Hall at uh, where the Hippodrome sat downtown. That was a rather large plantation looking house too that used to sit there. And he was part of that crew as well. So, and those, so these are people that founded Gainesville and it's been great, but it's also been fascinating hearing the stories of what got built first. Main Street, West Main Street was built first because that was gonna be the path to the railroad. The, unfortunately, a lot of this was the slave story, the building of the roads, the building of a lot of the original buildings, all that's very well documented. And um, basically hearing how the town grew. And what I've learned over time is so many buildings in my neighborhood have been moved and put in different positions. And you wouldn't have thought that. And, the, and when I moved my house, the historic board said, well, your house won't be, won't be considered contributing anymore because it's been moved to a different location. And I'm like, really? That makes no sense whatsoever. So what I have since discovered is Gainesville was built with dirt roads. And a lot of the roads that were platted were never there to begin with. So houses all over the duck pond were built. And then if you go back and do the history, you find, I'd say about 50% of them had been moved at one time or another. And who would have thought? But you know, Sam Gowan's house just as well. And uh, there's still a lot of houses in the neighborhood that I know are much older than people think they are because the records only go back so far. The histories only go back so far. And when you have houses that get moved, you lose the record of that house. One of the houses I found, the Barrows on, and it is a big one on six, shows up as a big two-story with two-story verandas. It was one of three, including the one I'm working on, on that side of the creek looking towards downtown. And that house was simply picked up, rotated in the other direction, and Victorianized. They put some bay windows on it. They did some other things, but the roof line, everything about it is completely wrong for a Victorian. And I guess just about guarantee you, that's another one. So anyway, it's, it's fun, but it's kind of like a personal challenge and puzzle for me. All right, any uh, questions? Jay, would you talk a little about the Matheson project? When you worked on the Matheson, the Matheson House, the Matheson, the, the um, American Legion, the church across the street. Okay, um, yes, um, as I mentioned, that was my first project along with my business partner at the time. We, he came from Gainesville at the same time, Greg Hall. And uh, basically, we were both preservation students in the mid 80s. So we got to see the Matheson house after it had burned, it had had a fire and go through it. And Mark was able, Mark Barrow was able to show us everything about it and kind of learn from these early period houses. Um, and recently I'm hearing that there's talk that the Matheson house is earlier than they think it is, which I believe it. Yeah, yeah. And it matches the other plantation houses I've worked on like Hale Plantation and all. And um, so we, got, to, we got, a, got our feet wet with it back then, but working on the Matheson Center, um, it was a really unique old building. It was really not in good shape. It had been let go for a while. It had issues, ironically, almost identical to what Thelma Bolton has now with uh, termites in the trusses, a leaky roof, and uh, certainly nothing that you would tear a building down over. And it has the same exact issues and ironically had the same engineer back then. <laughs> yep. And uh, so we got to do that project for uh, the Matheson Center group. And uh, it was a challenge. It went pretty well, I thought. We had an excellent contractor. 
And um, to this day, it still functions well. It's, of course, had many issues with HVAC and everything else, but that seems to be the nature of commercial architecture. Things change, and then you've got to update everything constantly. I've read that you're, you have just, uh, you're working on reconstructing the kitchen at uh, the Hale House. Is, how far along is that project? We have got the floor structure in place. We had just had the rough sawn lumber delivered. We are about to start framing up the building. This is an exact reproduction based on photographs and archeological evidence of where we dug up where the building sat. And we have pretty much nailed everything that we can see. The interiors of the building are gonna be unusual. They're gonna be exposed frame on the inside whitewashed the way they were. And the reason they did that is so you wouldn't have critters crawling in the walls. You could see everything and you did have a board ceiling, which it will have. We don't know if it had glass windows or not, but we are going to put some uh, antique windows in there just so we have daylight. But we're trying to keep it as authentic as possible. We're gonna use old brick to do an old cooking fireplace on one end of it where we knew it had it. We will also have an old potbelly stove in there that came later that we happen to have from the filming of the movie that was shot out there. And we have a lot of the original cooking equipment that will be going right back into it where it was. And this will be very important to Hale Plantation because it, the kitchen was highly significant in telling the story of that place. And it's really hard for people to understand that there was no kitchen inside the house, that the kitchen was out in the yard. And in the future, we hope to put back the smokehouse, some of the other auxiliary buildings, the privy, for instance, that all those buildings we have good documentation for. We have the remains of the old cistern out there where the water came off the roof of the house. We have pictures of the pump house. So that's something else we wanna put that back to, mm -hmm. to help tell the story of how it functioned. Well, there questions in the audience. Murray, right. here, take um, Murray. The mic. The mic. Well, I, there's a building that's no longer there, but when you were going through the process of the, of the fellowship hall, mm -hmm. and it was so important, the top of the, the bell tower, mm -hmm. Well, the reason I got involved in historic preservation around here was um, <laughs> my major professor gave me a picture of two pictures. One was a one-story building with a little simple bell tower on top. And the other was a two-story building with the same kind of bell. And he said, write me and do some research on this, find out why we have these two buildings and they have a similar bell tower. Mm -hmm. Well, what I found, it was the Union Academy mm -hmm. and it started out built by the black community. Right. Um, the site, the piece of ground is still there, of course, but the building is no longer there. But what happened was right after the Civil War, the black community wanted a school so they um, found, as you found, you find a, a builder or a carpenter or a plasterer when you need them, they'll come. Yep. So it was a one-story school, but the school soon outgrew itself and they simply took down the little bell tower, put it aside, built it in a second story, enlarged the building, put outside staircases to the second floor, and the top floor then became a teaching uh, academy to prepare black um, students who graduated to become the teachers for the rest of the black schools that were being built. And so they mm -hmm. just simply put the bell tower back on the top of the second story wood frame building. And it was so interesting, as you say, going, finding the records of the descriptions, the Sanborn maps and, and mm -hmm. the 
uh, census records. Who were these people? What did they do? Why did they do this? Sure. Buildings are no longer there, but there still were photographs. Oh, yeah. And that sort of launched me on being interested in doing what you do. So thank you for giving us these in <laughs> insightful um, looks at how it happens in Gainesville. I have two. I have two questions about uh, how they did things. Uh, one, uh, in terms of the bird's eye view, were those photographs or artistic drawings that were taken from a um, balloon, or was it just the imagination of the artist? And the second <coughs> question was, if they moved all these buildings early on, mm -hmm. how did they do that? Ironically. Um, the one behind the Thomas Center, that house was moved in the 20s um, when they were building, turning that house into a hotel at the time. Because it used to sit out in the middle of 7th Street. And when we started opening it up and looking at it from underneath, there was still a log in the middle of one of the stone rubble fire chimneys that came along with it. So basically they would put logs down, they would use mules, and just <laughs> seems very labor intensive compared to what I did, but yeah, that's how they did it originally. And I would say by the 30s, you're getting into machine operated stuff at that point. But uh, in the early days, that's how they did it. The bird's eye view, the bird's eye view having done bird's eye view stuff similar to that and axonometric, Really, you just go building per building and project it out and draw it like a perspective. That would be my guess. It's possible they had balloons, but around here, I kind of doubt it because this was the wild, wild west back then. So I really doubt they did anything that's sophisticated. Now, in larger cities where you see much more elaborate ones, I'd say that's possible, you know, we're talking in the 1880s, so even photography is possible. Yeah, I, I just don't know the answer to that. But, but when you look at the, you blow the drawings up and you look at it, you see they're very crude drawings. However, they're fairly accurate. I mean, you see chimneys where the chimneys are, windows and doors where the door, windows and doors are. Yeah, so somebody could have gone around and surveyed it. It's hard to say. I just don't know the answer to that. Yes. At, U, at UF, are there present day architecture students, are they interested in architectural preservation or has it gone a different avenue? No, there absolutely are. Um, there is still a pretty strong um, program at UF for historic preservation and uh, the Preservation Institute in Nantucket and also the Preservation Institute in St. Augustine that's part of the University of Florida. It's a little bit different in that you don't see as many architects in it as you used to. Um, uh, that's just, I don't know what the answer to that is. But to, at the time I went through, it was actually a specialty under the College of Architecture that you could do in, when you were doing your master's. And, uh, but it still exists, absolutely. <clears throat> when you're doing historic renovation and we're still can you how's that a better when you're doing historic reservation and people are still living in the house mm -hmm. how do you resolve the conflict the inherent conflict between modernization and being historically accurate for example i'm thinking of air conditioning Electrical might be easier, uh, but there are so many things like air conditioning yeah, yeah. that make the place more livable, more modern, yet if you don't have it, how do you resolve those kinds of questions? Every, every uh, structure we work on is an individual challenge. Um, this Italianate house I'm doing, this house was renovated in the 20s as a duplex up and down. And hard plaster walls every place, and we are actually taking all the ceilings down 
Reason are, we are, they are at the end of their life. They're cracked all over the place. It's time to take them down and replace them with new. We're keeping the walls. But the other thing we're doing, in that house, we are going to be going everywhere with mini splits, which is more the European style um, air conditioning, which is highly efficient, which is good for a place like this. But also the owners want to use these porches and actually live on them a good part of the year, which means they don't want the entire house heated and cooled. They want it room by room by room so they can have some doors open, some doors closed. And, you know, so that's that's how we're doing it in that case. Um, the things I've learned over the past is not the things you did like in the early days of renovation. You don't put a heating and air conditioning system under a house. I learned that personally on my house. And the other thing is you don't put it in a hot attic either. Generally, you have high ceilings. So when I retrofitted mine two years ago, I basically dropped the ceiling with a, with a soffit in one room and a little piece of the kitchen, put the HVAC over the laundry room on the porch. That got the downstairs unit up. And then the upstairs, I went with mini splits. So nothing is in the attic, and it is so much cheaper to heat and cool my house, and I have so much more control. So there are things you can do, but you definitely have to insulate these old houses. This house that I'm, that I'm starting right now has never had heating or air conditioning in it. It's had some old wall gas units for heat, but not air conditioning. Never had it. All the windows work perfectly. However, they're putting air conditioning in it. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Jay for being here. And again, uh, here in the room with Murray and Jay, we have two people who've made a huge difference in the Gainesville community. And for that, I thank you both.